The 10-year Treasury yield hovering near the key level of 5% south of the board. Investors are digesting yet another strong economic report out of the states, this time GDP. So where could the bond market go from here after this recent dramatic rise in rates? Joining us now to discuss Hafiz Norton, Vice President, Director and Active Fixed Income Portfolio Manager at TD Asset Management. Great to have you back on the program. It's great to be back. All right, so we have a lot to go through. We did get a pretty strong read on the U.S. economy today. We have been living in the past little while with this U.S. 10-year bond yield that just keeps flirting with 5%. We put it all together. Where are we? Yeah, so like you said, it's been a big move from about 4% to the around the 5% line with the U.S. 10-year um, usually what uh, causes bond yields to rise is you either have uh, tight monetary policy, so rising interest rates uh, from the central bank, um, or you'd have loose fiscal policy, so large borrowing from the government, which would mean that you know, rates have to go higher to, to fund that. Uh, the surprise this year is we've had both. Uh, and so you know, I think what was probably uh, more expected this year was the tight monetary policy. We're, having, we're getting the same story in terms of the data, like you said, of strong uh, growth led by the U.S., um, inflation that is, um, although it's declining, it's still well above the 2% target. Um, and then you have tight labor markets, um, and that's causing uh, wage growth to stay firm and fueling some concerns that it could feed into another round of inflation. Uh, but that's the part that was uh, generally known. Um, it's persisting for longer than what might have been expected. But what was a bit of a surprise this year is that looser fiscal policy at a time when generally you'd actually expect fiscal policy to get a little tighter. Um, the, the deficit in the U.S. in particular should have been lower than 5% of GDP. Instead, it surprised closer to 6 to 7% of GDP. So that's just a lot more money that needs to be borrowed in the market. Um, that's been fueling this latest move uh, in particular. What if the, we're talking about... Uh... Uh, you know, budget deficits larger than expected, spending larger than expected out of Washington. Is it time to start, start discussing bond vigilantes on these shores? I mean, I know they showed up in Britain last year. Uh, are they showing up in the States? Uh, yeah, I think to a certain extent that there, there is, um, you know, the, the marginal buyer of bonds is has changed uh, from what was there before. You know, in, in the past, we were used to the central bank with its QE programs um, being a consistent buyer of bonds. We were used to U.S. banks being consistent buyers uh, and foreign uh, uh, sovereign wealth funds and foreign uh, reserve managers from other countries generally being pretty consistent in the U.S. bond market. Um, they're all stepping back for different reasons. You know, we know there's quantitative tightening. U.S. banks don't have as much deposits as they used to. And so with that, we're seeing more of uh, the private sector being the one to step in as the marginal buyer, and they're definitely more price sensitive. So I wouldn't necessarily say we're um, in a, uh, a, a period where it's complete uh, vigilante mode. Uh, it's not like what we saw, say, in Greece or Italy, uh, but definitely more price sensitivity um, and therefore um, you know, more focus on this idea of what's a fair value um, of uh, you know, government bonds in the U.S. given the fiscal outlook and given uh, you know, policy rates in the central banks uh, have to stay higher for longer. Now, I come from a journalism background, so we love numbers like 5% or 4% because it's easy in terms of storytelling. Is there a significance in the real world, in the fixed income world, to a uh, 10-year yield at 5% or higher? There is actually merit to it because, you know, psychological levels actually um, make sense because at the end of the day, the market is just a bunch of humans, uh, all of which have behavioral biases. And so um, the 5% level has stuck out. Uh, again, it's a round number. But the other piece to think about is that you, the market tends to look back at a historical periods um, of when the U.S. tenure traded at 5%. And what you can point to is the 2006 to 2007 period before the global financial crisis. The peak in the U.S. tenure at that part of the cycle was around 5 to 5.2. So the market is, you know, moved, or, you know, repriced yields higher um, and is now thinking, okay, you know, are we similar in terms of this cycle uh, compared to 2006, 2007? You know, you can make the argument that growth was very strong then as it is now, um, but it probably had a bit of higher potential growth um, in the global economy sense. You had a much stronger China um, and much or stronger Europe. Um, and so you could see why rates were higher back then. But all the, on the flip side, you also had less government debt compared to, to what you have now. So it's kind of like, you know, you've got lower potential growth now, but higher uh, government debt and higher deficits. So, you know, I think we're, those are sort of balancing themselves out to kind of say that 5% uh, might be fair for the near term. Um, but, you know, I think what we have to look forward then is what happens when the labor market starts to crack a little bit. Um, you know, where do rates go? And we still think there's, um, you know, more room cyclically for uh, U.S. yields to come down. 
Now, the world continues to become a more dangerous place just in the past couple of weeks. A massive geopolitical event in the conflict in the Middle East. You put that on top of what was already transpiring for quite a bit of time with Ukraine and Russia. There's a lot of risk out there. And then bonds, I mean, traditionally, a haven play. Could we see a haven play for bonds that might bring down yields in the next little while? They, they should, over the long run, con, uh, continue to provide that safe haven status in a portfolio. Um, it, that hasn't worked um, for the last few months for sure. Um, correlations with bonds and equities have gotten more positive, so their uh, bonds and equities are moving up or moving down together. Um, and largely goes back to you know, the, the idea that um, there are concerns right now about funding these fiscal deficits and the large amount of issuance. So I think that's been skewing those correlations. Um, so right now we've seen the safe haven um, uh, status be more evident in the U.S. dollar um, and in gold. You know, I think those are two, two uh, markets where um, you know, we've seen that correlation be more negative relative to equities. Uh, but I think bigger picture in a longer uh, um, you know, time frame, um, you know, bond yields will continue to still be a, a major flight to quality asset, particularly U.S. Treasuries, just because um, you, you generally um, you know, still have a lot of foreign investors coming into the U.S. market um, when they are trying to you know, seek protection from their capital. Of course, you mentioned earlier about central banks sort of got this ball rolling about a year and a half ago. We heard from our central bank yesterday. We're getting the Fed next week. I think we got the European central bank. So there's, a, there's a lot going on in this space. What's intriguing to you? What's standing out for you? Yeah, so I, I would glean from all of those that they're in the similar stage of a, call it a hawkish hold, right? So they, they, they've done a lot of tightening. Um, they're seeing growth data staying strong, but not necessarily running away. Um, and they're seeing inflation coming down from the peaks and, you know, generally trending back to target, but at a fairly slow pace. So um, this idea that they want to pause and be at these very restrictive um, uh, rate levels um, and see how it plays out, but also commit to keeping those rates higher for longer. You know, that's the balance they're playing of not sounding too dovish by pausing. Um, showing that they have, uh, you know, commitment to keep to getting inflation down, um, and that may mean that there's, you know, no rate cuts anytime soon. You know, for the Fed and Bank of Canada in particular, really looking to the second half of next year uh, for when we could see rate cuts if inflation does meet uh, the targets that they're seeing for next year.